Okay, welcome to a brief chalk talk on the uh, proton NMR spectrum of allyl ether groups. This is something that most of us discussed during our reflux in class this week. Uh, however, Friday afternoon students, uh, you didn't get this, so we're going to be uh, distributing it online. So let's start by taking a look at the allyl ether group itself. Uh, I pictured it below here with just a generic R group as the uh, attached scaffold. Um, it can be whatever you like. Of course, in our case, it's the rest of the vanilla alcohol molecule. Now, what I want to point out here to start is that the allyl ether group contains two general classes of protons. First are the vinyl protons. Now, these are protons that are attached directly to an sp2 carbon. The second class of protons are allyl protons. And we use this term to refer to the protons which are adjacent to an sp2 carbon, but are themselves attached to an sp3 carbon. The allyl ether group, uh, by its nature, results in four chemically distinct protons on this particular side of the ether bond. We have three different vinyl protons, and that results from the lack of free rotation about the pi bond, which makes this an allyl group. Now the two protons that I've highlighted in black are in fact uh, identical in some molecules but may be diastereotopic in others depending upon the nature of the R group. But for this case since we're working on a generic allyl ether group I'm going to leave them as uh, being exactly the same as one another. Now because we have uh, so many different chemically distinct protons around this allyl ether group, there are going to be uh, a lot of couplings going on here, a lot of magnetic coupling. Uh, and even more interesting than that is that the coupling constants between and among these protons are not our average of 5, 6, or 7 hertz as we're used to seeing necessarily. So let's take a look at the approximate coupling constants for all of these and try to use them to predict the multiplicity of the resonances we expect to see. The first would be our terminal alkene or our terminal vinyl protons. You can see that they're clearly in two chemically distinct environments owing to the restricted rotation around the double bond. The one highlighted in red is of course cis to the rest of the molecule, while the one highlighted in blue is cis to the other vinyl proton. Because these two are chemically distinct, they can and often do have different chemical shifts meaning that they can and often do magnetically couple. The constant for such a coupling is typically around 2 hertz. If we continue to work our way across this group, we note that there are a cis uh, relationship between the blue and green protons, which produces a coupling constant of about 10, 11, or 12 hertz. I'm going to use 10 hertz to make my math easy. And there are also transalkene protons which couple to one another at approximately 15 hertz, possibly 16, 17, or 18. But again, to, to keep nice round numbers, I'm going to use 15 as my approximation. And then finally, my interior vinyl proton couples to the allyl protons. But because these are separated by a sigma bond only, which has free rotation, we expect the coupling constants to be more typical, such as 5, 6, or 7 hertz. So let's use these numbers to uh, see what we can discover about, or what we can predict rather, about the NMR spectrum that we'll be seeing. Let's start with the proton that we had highlighted in blue. This particular proton will be coupled to two other protons within the molecule, with its geminal neighbor and with its cis alkene neighbor as well. As we said before, the cis coupling should be about 10 hertz, and the geminal coupling should be about 2 hertz. So what does this mean with respect to the multiplicity of the resonance created by that proton we have highlighted in blue? Well, if I create a plot with an x-axis in hertz, and I mark along that axis the resonance frequency of the blue proton, I'll have a single frequency associated with it. This is the Larmor frequency of the proton, which is a result of its gyromagnetic ratio, the applied magnetic field, and any shielding, deshielding, or anisotropic effects from pi electrons moving about. However, I'm not going to see any signal in my actual NMR spectrum at this frequency. 
and the reason for this is the magnetic coupling to its neighbors. I'm going to begin by applying the effect of the magnetic coupling to its cis neighbor, the one circled in green. This is the 10 Hz coupling, meaning that if the coupled proton is in the alpha spin state, it accelerates the lawnmower frequency by 5 Hz. And if the coupled proton is in the beta spin state, it will decelerate the coupling of the associated proton by 5 Hz. So I have to split my signal. It splits into two equal lobes with a total distance between them of 10 Hz. I have another proton to consider, and that is the geminal proton, which is circled in red. In this case, the coupling constant is only 2 Hz, meaning that whether this particular proton circled in red is spin up or down in a given molecule will only affect the resonance frequency of the coupled proton by 1 Hz. So if I split my feature by this 2 Hz coupling constant, I can predict the multiplicity of the peak that I'll see. In this case, we get what we call a doublet of doublets. This is not to be confused with a quartet. A quartet results from three equal couplings, whereas a doublet of doublets results from two non-equal couplings. And though each creates four lobes in the multiplet, their features and relative intensities are different. But I can go farther than simply describing this as a doublet of doublets. Because I know or can estimate the coupling constants, I can estimate the actual distances between the lobes within my multiplet. For example, the distance between the two peaks I've marked here should be 2 Hz, because the associated coupling that creates them is 2 Hz. And furthermore, the center on center distance between my two features should be about 10 Hz. So I know not only that this will be a doublet of doublets, but I know about how far apart each of these lobes should be within that multiplet. This will help me unambiguously assign this multiplet to its associated proton. Now let's go through the same exercise for the other terminal final proton, this time highlighted in red. It has a coupling to a trans alkene proton at 15 Hz approximately, and to its geminal neighbor at 2. If I go through the same exercise that we just did, using the resonance frequency of that red proton as my starting point, coupling it first by 15 Hz, and again by 2 Hz, I can see that I will have a very similar feature to that which we discovered previously, a doublet of doublets. At first glance, it may appear that this means I'll have an ambiguous assignment in which I can't actually tell which of my doublets of doublets is generated by which of the two terminal alkene protons. However, I can unambiguously assign them because I know that the features are going to be different in the sense that there will be a 15 Hz coupling between my two smaller doublets rather than a 10 Hz coupling. So a wider feature indicates to me that I'm dealing with the proton which is trans to its coupling partner, rather than cis. Using this information, I can make my assignment. Next, I'd like to talk to you just briefly about the other vinyl proton within this functional group, and I'll be letting you finish the rest of this exercise for yourself. This is a particularly interesting resonance because this uh, proton is coupled to many, many partners. It's coupled to four hydrogens, and there are three different coupling constants. So in order to predict the multiplicity of this particular proton's resonance, I will have to first split it by 15 hertz, then by 10, then by 5, and then again by 5 to produce a very large, very distinct multiplet. This multiplet is going to be very simple to find, and it's going to be a great starting point in my assignment because it is so unique. However, instead of doing this one for you, I'm going to let you do this particular one yourself. So in the final analysis, before we make our way down to the NMR spectrometer, we should already have predicted what we expect to see for a successful experiment. In this case, a successful experiment involves the attachment of an allyl ether, so we'll be looking for resonances associated with that. We've already predicted two of the four multiplets that we'll be using, 
and I'm going to leave it to you to figure out the other two for yourself.